G'day folks, I'm looking forward to having a chat with Mir Imran, a prolific serial entrepreneur for the last 40 years. Mir has founded over 20 medtech companies, including VentureTex, Cardiac Pathways, Perky Surge, and most recently, Rani Therapeutics, most of which have been sold to larger corporations or have gone public. He's credited with the invention of multiple technologies that have advanced healthcare, including the automatic implantable defibrillator. His incubator Incube has been the source of many of those inventions. Mir holds over 700 patents, but does not hang his hat on those. What is even more intriguing about Mir is how he got here and the insights he's gained over his expansive and prolific career. Born in India, he came to the US to pursue a dream of putting his creative spirit into action. He obtained bioengineering and electrical engineering undergraduate and master's degrees from Rutgers University and attended three years of med school. We will learn what drives him to identify problems worth solving, the pivotal events and the people that shaped his viewpoints, and his philosophy about innovation. Welcome, Mia. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure. Oh, that's, yeah, really appreciate it. So how about you tell us a little bit about your early life. Where did you grow up and, and what was that like? You take me back 66 years. It's <laughs> uh, <laughs> good. Good journey. Yeah, so I was born in India in, in a city called Hyderabad. Um, my father was a physician and uh, mother was into literature and poetry and so on. Um, and uh, there were no entrepreneurs or business people in my family. Um, I, growing up as a young boy, um, as young boys are, very curious and uh, destructive. Um, I, I, pe people thought I was destructive, but I had a purpose mm -hmm. for destroying things, which was to learn about, you know, how things work. Um, so, um, the the um, uh, catalyst event in my life was uh, a conversation uh, with my mom, uh, where uh, you know she used to scold me about just breaking everything. Your mom, your mother, sorry. Sounds right. like a remarkable person and, and she sat you down. Yeah. You said you were four or five. Yep. You were, as you, as you acknowledged, you were destructive is right. what she said. Uh, she sat you down and, and, and you two came to an agreement. Yeah. I think this would be good for, for young yeah, parents so, out there. So she said, you know, I don't like uh, punishing you or, uh, you know, yelling at you please stop doing this. What can I do to help you stop? Um, so I apparently said, I have of course no memory of yeah. it, uh, that um, buy two of everything, whatever you get, any machine or, and give me one and I'll do whatever I want with it and I won't touch the other one. She liked that uh, response so much that she, she actually implemented it. So I had, and she gave me a room, which was probably about the size of this room, mm -hmm. um, uh, as my lab, a big bench. And uh, the money I was making from selling stuff, I bought tools and instruments. So I had a little workshop. Um, uh, and uh, people from my community, they, the word had gotten, uh, gotten around that I, uh, could fix anything. So I think she would, she, but, she but didn't the, dissuade you, right? She found a way to make make it work. Yeah, so she, that, um, um, her approval or as I call it, license to kill, break and destroy things that yeah. I got from her, that she bought, uh, really gave me that intellectual freedom that kids, that, that gets taken away by their parents. You know, that's why I wanted to make that point. I think that was it, a it unique. Is. Approach. I, I think that was a, that was a catalyst event. Yeah, and and it, you know, my curiosity knew no bounds. Had any bit of technology or a black box, from radios to sewing machines to um, wrist watches, uh, everything. You know, this technology in those days was pretty simple, so it didn't take long to. Le learn, break everything. <laughs> did uh, you, 
So, and I couldn't put it back together, obviously. You know, at age five, six, you, you're um, just... Um, but I got exposed to every technology incorporated in those devices. Um, metals, how they're joined, uh, mechanical stuff, electronics. Didn't understand a bit of electronics. Um, but uh, slowly I started putting things together. And then I said, I want to start building. So uh, learning about toys and how they work. I, I used to build them uh, out of materials that, uh, you know, the, there's a, 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 a grain called jawar. They, they, it's like a corn, but mm -hmm. it, this corn, the stalk of that, inside was a, um, a styrofoam-like material. And the outer skin was very tough, so you, once you took and very thin, so you could make all kinds of toys with that styrofoam and 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 the skin, uh, cut them into strips, uh, and I used to sell them to my friends in school. So entrepreneurial, make, you know, and I used to figure out how to make many of them, uh, and it it, uh, it wasn't enough for me to understand things or but I wanted to see how I make them. And then um, probably around eighth grade, uh, seventh, eighth grade, I really got into electronics. I got hold of a um, popular electronics magazine, one. Mm -hmm. Somebody had uh, left it behind uh, at my home. I found it and it was, uh, I must have read it a thousand times, everything and the little advertisements and so on. I really got into it. So I found a um, night institute, you know, for vocational institute for radio repair. So I signed up for that. I was the only boy. The others were, uh, you know, people in their 30s and 40s uh, learning a trade and uh, vacuum tube technology, transist introduction to transistors. I did that course after school. Um, and uh, really opened the door to, to a completely new world. And I realized that, uh, so I, I had a physics teacher, um, uh, Mr. Kunju, and uh, I used to bug him all the time, you know, how does this work, how does that? So he was really helpful and encouraged me. And um, I started going to these used book shops, which were, um, on the street, on the sidewalk. So they'd have hundreds of books lined up, textbooks and this, and you go and buy it for pennies. So I used to buy all the physics and chemistry textbooks. And uh, how old were you? I was probably 10, 11, 12, yes. in that range, 11, 12. And I used to read and didn't understand 95% of it. But some of it was seeping in and the course helped me and my experience of materials helped me understand some of the things that practical hands-on experience, a feel for everything really helped. Um, uh, and then um, I used to build uh, transistor radios, um, single transistor radios in a matchbox and sell them. But uh, I used those funds to start applying to universities when I was in 10th grade. So I mentioned that I used to make these matchbox radios mm -hmm. in a literal matchbox. Um, and what I needed was a battery. And in those days, you know, C and D uh, and double A's had just come, come around and nine volt batteries were just introduced. Of course, it, immediately the day I found a nine volt battery it came apart. And what I found inside are six cylindrical cells that are connected in series. That's how you get nine volts. And I, and it, that little cell fit inside the, the matchbox perfectly. So I used to buy new ones, take out the cells, put a lab my name label <laughs> on it. And I used to sell those uh, cells and I wouldn't tell them where I got them because they weren't available unless you bought a nine volt battery and opened it. So it's just, you know, how things 
um, happen. Solutions come because you are interacting with so many different things. Mm -hmm. So you needed a battery and I had a whole uh, understanding of uh, what size batteries, what shape and what not. And um, that's where I used the 9 volt battery, the cells in the 9 volt battery. So hang on, just for, for kids watching this, we shouldn't do that today, right? Break open batteries or should uh, they? No, I, I, it's not a good idea unless you put on <laughs> gloves. Well, it's just sorry, it's, I'm sitting here listening. It's remarkable. I, what was I doing at that age? I was probably outside kicking a football. Yeah, not doing I, I mean, that, that's, I, a lot of my friends were doing that. But, you know, I, um, I was also a voracious reader. I, um, I was into um, Western movies and Western novels. Um, uh, Louis Lemoor and uh, mm -hmm. so many others, um, uh, uh, you know, classical literature. So I, I had a pretty well-rounded uh, set of interests, poetry, because of my mother. Um, uh, You're still into poetry? Yes. All right, so it sounds like a, you know, a remarkable childhood, mm -hmm. very entrepreneurial. Very um, much so. Very so I, was, I was driven to make things and um, sell, sell them. So what was the drive, what was the motivation to, to come to the States? So, um, there, you know, in, uh, growing up in school and, uh, and you know, uh, my grandmother used to send me to pay the bills once a month, water, water bill and electricity bill, those were only two utilities. And um, you had to go stand in line. There was no concept of check writing or um, or mailing the check. Uh, ma so you had to stand in the, in the line with the um, cash and there was a long line in the sun and the cashier would be having tea and smoking cigarettes in his booth and somebody or the other would come and, and go past the whole line, uh, go straight and uh, you know, say hello to him, uh, give him some money, pay his bill and get out. And I just in, used to infuriate me. You know, every, anybody would be super they were paying a bribe to jump to the Yeah, the bribe. The yeah. I mean, yeah. and it just puts everyone at a disadvantage. Yeah. And it's so, so unfair. Um, and uh, there was also cheating and bribery going on in school, and I, I don't mean everyone was doing it. There were a lot of kids that were totally straight and honest, but there were some teachers who were, didn't have the ethics and some students didn't have the ethics, but it was very pervasive. And it still is, in, uh, you know, uh, you could buy a degree, um, you know. With it would have been a lot easier for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, that was that really uh, was such an emotional um, thing for me. The the uh, lack of ethics, and I I thought you know I could never have a fair chance growing up here unless I played the same game. Mm -hmm. So I started uh, contacting universities all around the world: U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, New Zealand. Uh, all English speaking places and um, started writing to them from got the addresses from the library and started getting these big envelopes with applications and so on and uh, the long story short I ended up um, getting admission in a number of universities I took the SAT uh, test uh, which was itself a um, you took the SAT test in India. <laughs> I went to an American consulate 500 miles away uh, to take the test. Um, but I got admission and then uh, came to the U.S., uh, went through engineering. And what happened, you know, I, I, I didn't have enough money to go through the full four years, so I completed it in half the time. So let's go back, though, because I want to go back that you, you first came across Right, and you had four thousand dollars in your pocket. Four thousand, yeah. And that then I like, got another five hundred dollars later. Forty-five hundred dollars. Yeah. But you ended up at you're up in Rochester. 
Yeah, and I, uh, University of Rochester was a private university, so I had no... But you didn't uh, know that before you I didn't it. know anything, yeah. any difference between private and public. So went there um, and uh, found out that uh, the 4,000 wouldn't even be enough for the first year. Um, so the dean of missions there was uh, very kind, and he said the... Uh, the, his counterpart at Rutgers was a friend of his and said, I'll mail your document. I had, you know, near perfect scores on SAT, so I, he said, you, you'll, there, there won't be any issue. And um, uh, I ended up at Rutgers and uh, there was no, uh, the, the, the feast was not calculated based on how many credits you took. So if you were a full-time student, you had to have 12 credits or, or more. And I did the or more part. Yeah, so I like this. You went in and asked. Yeah. And so they told you you needed to do 12 credits. And you said, no, that's not what I'm asking. How many can I do? Yeah, and they couldn't answer that. <laughs> and what did you do? Uh, th about on average 30, 32 credits um, per semester. Um, <laughs> and some graduate courses, some undergraduate. But you know, what, what happened was all those um, probably um, 10, 12, 13 years of hands-on experience growing up in, in yep. India and all those projects I did, they came to life as I was taking those courses. I, you know, the theory, as I say, you you the know, theory. it just sort of yeah. said, oh, okay, that's how it worked. And, yeah. and I, so as I was taking courses, that experience was getting refreshed and, and it made sense to me then. Uh, and so by the time I finished my degree, I had a dozen years of experience yep. that I could actually draw on, right? And um, so, so my first encounter um, with medical technology was um, the f uh, a summer, the first summer I spent here. I was still an undergrad. And there was a little uh, sign on the bulletin board uh, saying, we need help with um, uh, uh, making some uh, communication aids for our cerebral palsy children. So this was th hmm. the Matheny School for C Cerebral Palsy Children in Peapack, New Jersey. Um, and so I told the phone, uh, you know, those little things called them and, and they said, okay, come over and tell us. So uh, uh, I met the speech therapist and she said, we have this quadriplegic, beautiful girl, um, uh, Jenny, and she, we can't figure out how to communicate. She doesn't have a voluntary um, control over any muscle group. So, so she can't even say yes, no, or, you know, um, so we need somebody to make a communication device yeah. for this little girl. So can you do it? I said, of course I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and so I get, got to work. I said, I'm going to spend time with the girl uh, for a few days. Every day I would go there um, in the morning and play with her. Uh, she she would she had no control over anything and but she uh, then I, I I found out just playing with her that there was some um, uh, when when she wanted to get something she, there was some muscle group that actually she had control voluntary control so I designed a a, a sensor for that so that she could move a cursor. Uh, on a on a screen, so um, um, uh, it took the entire summer to build it from scratch. Even the the box it, it went in, the electronics, everything. And uh, at the end of the summer, I gave it to them, and the girl was thrilled. The speech mm -hmm. therapists were amazed that in such a short time, concept to finish, because I, I I didn't have anything else to do. I would work all day and all night, you know, mm -hmm. 18 hours a day. So um, the contract was for $2,000. And at the very end, you know, my last day, I handed over that. 
they had a little party for me, you know, a cake, and, <laughs> and, a, and a, they gave me a book um, and a card. Everybody signed it, and uh, they gave me the check for two thousand dollars. And um, the uh, I needed the money, right? Yeah. Just broke, flat broke. Um, the the experience was so powerful, uh, and just watching the impact on that little girl, that you know, I turned it down. It's had a profound impact. It's still I can see the emotion today. Yeah. And as you said, this is number of years later. I think the the two thousand dollar check would have meant a lot to you at the time. Oh yeah. Because remember telling this, you were telling the story you know, when we spoke yesterday that you didn't have anywhere to stay. Yeah, yeah. So this is now when you're at Rutgers, right? So when I had just arrived, uh, I met a, um, an Indian student at the admissions office and um, he, I had no place to stay. I was sleeping on benches in train stations and bus stops um, for two, three days, nights already. Um, making a circuitous path to Rutgers. Um, so he said, hey, you can stay at my place and I'll, I can help you find a room. So uh, he had a room in an old building just off campus with, you know, 10 other Indians in a four-story building, really old. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, is there a room here? He said, no, there's no room here. So then I noticed a walk-in closet that he had. I said, what about that? He said, it's a closet. Um, <laughs> and I said, I, I can put a bed, I, that's all I need. So he said, are you sure? And I said, yeah. So he helped me find a bed, a metal cot, and my suitcase, and that's all I had um, and, and needed. And $20 a month rent uh, that I paid to him. And I ended up spending about the same amount a month on food, you know, boiled rice and, and lentils. Um, so, uh, and I didn't think anything of it. Yeah, that's, you know, I think that's I'd the remarkable leave bit. Early in the morning, all my classes, and then uh, go and have, uh, go come back, have dinner, go to the library till midnight, and then just sleep there. So it, it was perfect um, setup. That's an interesting way of putting it. So when I was an undergraduate, I had I started a company on my my first company to develop a microprocessor based uh, security system. This is, mind you, with thirty credits per semester. Yeah. I found time to do that, and and the, why did I do that? I got a credit card in the mail with five hundred dollar credit <laughs> limit, and in those days, along with the credit card, you 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 would get blank checks. So you could write a check. So um, I said, my God, $500. <laughs> I can, it's, I, you know, microprocessors were just coming of age. Uh, there was a little company out here called uh, Intel <laughs> that made a, uh, I think, four-bit microcontroller. So I was really into that. And, I, and a friend of mine had a burglary at his home. He was looking for alarm system. So he talked to me. I said, ah, I can build one. And uh, so I designed and built it and installed it. And um, uh, and then I, I decided, he said, you know, a lot of my friends wanted to. So I incorporated a company. I researched how to incorporate it. And uh, the company was called Ionix Inc., uh, subchapter S, um, no lawyers. And um, you know, used the 500 bucks from the, the credit card. But then my schoolwork became so intense that I couldn't do that and I had spent the money and I went on a payment plan with the yeah. credit card company. A year or so later, I met another student and he saw what I had done. He, and he was a packaging engineer. He said, Mir, that your product looks like shit. Uh, sorry, looks like <laughs> hell. <laughs> <laughs> That's tough. <laughs> uh, because uh, he, and he was he worked part time at Revlon. He he made beautiful packaging for cosmetics. 
He said, I'll design the packaging and let's start a company together. The, the restart. So we formed a new company. But I said, um, uh, we need more money than $500. So we decided to apply for many, many different cards. <laughs> oh, no. And the idea was uh, we would cash out money from uh, three or four cards and then use the others to period, you know, make Pay. payments. Mm -hmm. Ponzi scheme, which is, uh, <coughs> I guess, the uh, Bernie Madoff uh, um, thing, you know. You yep. Illegal, <laughs> but I didn't know that. And um, uh, long story short, I, we went on another payment plan that didn't work. <laughs> and and I can, you know, when I was grad school, in grad school, I got a uh, teaching assistantship. So I, I and all the, you know, uh, expenses were paid, tuition was paid for, just like it happens now, and um, five hundred dollars a month. And I've never felt richer. I had never, you know, mm -hmm. since even since then, that I made five hundred dollars in a month, and I I saved that money, stayed in that same closet, and then returned it to my dad because he had borrowed it. Hey, folks! I hope you found that as enlightening as I did. I'm sure learning about Mir's curiosity, creativity, and resourcefulness is igniting your own, as sure did for me. But there's so much more to uncover about Mir. Make sure you subscribe to Medtech Trailblazers to learn more about his remarkable journey as an innovator in the second episode of this series. See you soon.